me here. Uh, my name is Lydia Zeininger. Welcome this evening. I'm the executive director of the Ukrainian Institute of America. We are so pleased to have you here. It's a very important day. Uh, the past several days, as you know, we've all been spending time commemorating the 90th anniversary of the or 90th year of commemorating the Holodomor in Ukraine. So it's a solemn occasion, which is the reason we decided to continue a discussion about serious topics and the crime of genocide. Uh, before we begin, two things. One, just logistics. Please mute your devices. We appreciate no phones going off along the way and watches. And then what we started to do on February 24th of this year is we just take a moment of silence at the beginning of each of our events. So I may ask you to stand now and reflect with me on the sacrifices that so many in Ukraine have made and are even making as we are here now in this room uh, and the loss. And so please join me for just a moment. Thank you so much. So for all of those who have Ukrainian background and all of those who care about Ukrainians, you know that there are serious things happening in the world and we've been commemorating serious events of the past, as I've already said. Um, we want to give a, f I would just want to notice, note a few things. One, we are very proud in the Institute to have a special commemorative plaque for Raphael Lemkin, which is a room downstairs. I hope you go visit that after the program. He, um, I guess, was the father of using the term genocide for the type of activities that we have experienced, our heritage, our ancestors, uh, and many others in the world. So we pay tribute to him through that plaque and hope you go and uh, reflect down there as well. We want also to give thanks to a few different organizations. One is Kiev Mohila uh, Academy, National University of Kiev Mohila Academy, and the Faculty of Law, from whom some of our distinguished guests hail from Ukraine. We thank them for traveling. We also, if you've noticed, we're using an image from Maria Primachenko on the materials that we've used for the brochure and for marketing. The reason for that is, of course, that she, her artwork, her collections were victims of recent destruction, uh, recent acts of cultural genocide in Ukraine. Her uh, museum with her artworks were directly and specifically targeted and destroyed. And so we thank the Primachenko Family Foundation for letting us use the image that we have here, the swamp bogey. They thought he would be sort of an uplifting and fun uh, way to portray horrors of the past because Ukrainians always have that mix of sort of that dark, dark humor. Um, finally, I give thanks to Thaisa Marcus who has organized this important event for us tonight. Thaisa is an adjunct professor in the Department of Law at the University of Illinois and visiting professor at uh, the Department of Law at Kiev Mohila Academy. And so you are here to hear them and the important discussion. I turn the floor over to you and thank you all for being here. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Lida. Um, and first of all, I would like to thank everyone for coming on a Saturday night to hear about a rather somber, somber topic. And I have the privilege of sharing this platform with uh, very accomplished legal scholars, um, art historians, and heritage preservation specialists who all are deeply concerned about the damage the war on, in Ukraine, on Ukraine is inflicting on Ukrainian people and on Ukrainian culture and identity. What, what we would like to do this afternoon is tie public international law considerations and analysis with what is happening on the ground in Ukraine. It is the 75th anniversary of the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, the Genocide Convention, which the United Nations approved unanimously, including uh, at the time the Soviet Union. Um, as Dida mentioned, there is a plaque in this building on the ground floor um, in English, Ukrainian, and Hebrew, um, basically um, honoring Raphael Lemkin, uh, a graduate of the University of Lviv, 
who coined the term genocide and uh, worked relentlessly during his entire life to codify uh, the crime of genocide into inter public international law. Uh, he was in particular struck by not only the Holocaust, but uh, the Armenian genocide. Um, so I urge you to go downstairs. The, it's the room to, to, to your right when you enter. It's really quite moving. Um, the, and then uh, one thing um, that, that's, that, that, that we can't forget is that the current war on Ukraine, the full-scale invasion, do present the opportunity for public international law to evolve uh, with the goal of achieving accountability now and in the future for various international crimes. So um, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, um, Vladimir Venher, the Dean of the Faculty of Law at Cave Mohill Academy and a visiting research fellow at Oxford. Uh, Dean Venher is a constitutional law scholar who has a particular focus on the implementation of the rule of law. He's one of the architects of the declaration by the Ukrainian parliament uh, on the crime of genocide. So Dean Volodymyr, I pass the floor to you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be here and for all taking uh, your time. Um, I just want to briefly present key ideas of uh, this topic. And first of all, I want to present some activities related to the parliamentary uh, declaration on genocide, which is uh, very important uh, from uh, today's event topic. Because when full-scale aggression started, at our law faculty, we initiated, we developed a special initiative rule, a rule of law in wartime. And we decided to unite best Ukrainian legal professionals to support Ukrainian government and uh, Ukrainian parliament in doing something. At that time, it was quite difficult to uh, understand what are the real needs of uh, parliament and of Ukrainian government. And uh, one of key priorities was to pay attention for international community, uh, for, for, for all that we can say in very soft manner uh, activities in Ukraine. And uh, having extremely rich expertise at our law faculty on international law, international criminal law and some other spheres, we were requested by the Speaker of the Parliament to work on uh, that draft. Uh, we united more than 30 experts from Ministry of Foreign Affairs, from different universities, from different research institutions to work on that document. For lawyers, it's quite challenging to work on uh, crime issues or international crime issues without court proceedings. Because it's very normal that without court's decision, it's impossible to talk about uh, any kind of crime. And uh, drafting parliamentary act, which is political, political document, just political statement from political authority, it was not really easy because we tried to combine both legal arguments, legal reasoning, um, some um, evidence-based analysis, and of course, some emotions. Because at that time, uh, it was first weeks of March 2022, 20, it was not really easy to concentrate on purely legal uh, reasoning. But I'm really happy that uh, on April 14th, we received declaration of the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine on genocide committed by the Russian Federation in Ukraine. You can take a look on that document on a parliamentary website and you will see that right now it is the only document translated in English, both in English and in Ukrainian, uh, to uh, present not only the text of the document, but also explanatory note. Uh, I'm explaining these peculiarities just to, to stress 
your attention that it's not really easy to go deeper from legal perspective on that topic. It's not really easy to assess and to have very, very direct uh, results, which mean direct results, which mean uh, decision of the, of the international court uh, or tribunal. Um, but um, the aim of this event, the aim of activities at our law faculty, at our law school, um, is uh, to provide very clear reasoning, very clear arguments for all the Ukrainians and all people who support Ukraine to understand that we have the elements of the crime genocide committed against Ukraine. So uh, our law faculty, we united for all that activities. We have um, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, resources for that, and I'm really happy to uh, be here and to introduce our professor Kobal, who is one of the most prominent professors in that field, not only in Ukraine, but um, in Europe and maybe all over the world. Right now we are working on a transformation of UN standards on that direction, which are purely concentrated on something different, on a civil war or something like internal uh, military conflict. So from that perspective, I just want to name only, 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 only short uh, points about these to discuss and maybe to, 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 to stress your attention. The first and the most important when we talk about genocide from a legal point of view to, 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 to talk not only about um, all things committed by Russians from February 2022. From our perspective, all that activities should be assessed with uh, historical background. We should take into account all crimes committed against Ukrainian nation during 20th century and many years before that. And that terms used by the Russian leadership as a denazification of Ukraine, which means uh, de-Ukrainization which means uh, distillation of Ukrainian history, uh, appropriation of Ukrainian history, um, all achievements uh, in the field of science, culture, and art. And uh, it's extremely important to take into account this historical background and to assess all facts, understanding the real roots of Russian intent. And, uh, all facts which we will present today and discuss today, uh, considering the actions taken to prohibit the use of Ukrainian language, and the Ukrainian language books, the destruction of such books, the instant introduction of education in Russian language in occupied territories, are really well-known facts which could prove the crime of genocide committed right now. And uh, I'm really happy to be in this panel and have very famous professors, and uh, I will transfer over there. Thank you. Um, thank you, Volodymyr. And um, I, I do think uh, I'd like to echo what you said, which is that there is this disconnect between uh, the rule of law, actually find, convicting someone of a crime, and just the outrage and the emotion and really the morality of what is happening. And um, I, I think our next speaker will, um, I, I think, go into this a little bit further. Um, Jen's, uh, in, in that, in sort of telling us generally about the evolution of the crime of genocide, the different components, um, maybe some procedural issues around that, because in my mind, clearly what's happening is a genocide, but the, you, you, no one's convicted. No one has committed that crime until they've been convicted. But the elements are all there, as Vladimir said. So uh, Jens Meyerhoff, uh, Meyer Henrich is our next speaker. Um, he is a visiting professor of law at Columbia Law School and professor of international relations at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Um, he is the author of numerous books and articles on genocide 
And he is the editor of one anthology that I do urge everyone to pick up. It's, it's called Genocide. Um, I personally found it very instructive in that it covers the history of the many and, and horrible genocides, um, including the Holodomor, and really is a very good explainer on, on both the history and the legal analysis. Um, so I, uh, prof I will uh, pass this along to Professor Meyer Henrich, who will speak about the development of the crime of genocide, the elements of the crime, specific historical instances, um, and uh, accountability for the crime. Um, thank you very much, um, Teresa. And let me start by saying I'm um, uh, very delighted to be here, honored to be here, to be uh, joining this, this uh, very important panel and to be allowed to speak to you. This is uh, very meaningful for me personally. Um, and I hope um, we will be able to um, um, have interesting conversations also in the, um, in the aftermath of this um, event. Um, as you can probably gather from my accent, um, or as you might surmise, I'm German. Um, so I come from a perpetrator nation. Um, and the study of genocide is, such, is as such both personal and, and a professional um, um, endeavor for me. Um, the um, genocide arena that Teresa mentioned was published in 2014, and um, unfortunately then I included um, uh, two pieces on the Holodomor. Unfortunately, back then, um, there was not much scholarship on this particular genocide. And again, this is another uh, reason why this is a meaningful event um, uh, for me, because you were commemorating the anniversary. And I'm, I'm glad to say that now more knowledge is available, uh, and, and this particular genocidal campaign is taken more seriously than it was even a decade ago. Um, so this is perhaps... Um, a little bit of progress in trying to understand what often is known as the um, sort of the crime of scri crimes or scourge of um, humanity. Um, it's also um, uh, interesting, of course, that uh, Rafael Lemkin, the Polish lawyer who coined um, this term in 1944, is, as we've heard, commemorated um, downstairs. Now, Rafael Lemkin um, introduced this term in a very big book, um, sort of right smack in the middle. Um, you could be forgiven for missing it if you read this book, um, which he published in 1944 uh, with funding from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, and this was, in a way, a, a compilation of legal statutes and other instruments that uh, Germans and their collaborators had enacted in the course of the Second World War in order to also administer genocide and the Holocaust. And he believed it important uh, to understand the legal causes um, of genocide uh, in order to then also to bring the law to bear on responding to it. So for him, for Raphael Lemkin, international law in particular was always sword and shield. Um, and what's interesting perhaps for our conversation today, which will revolve um, uh, later today, and, and as Vladimir already um, um, intimated, uh, around cultural destruction um, in, in Ukraine. Um, these kinds of acts of violence were very important to Raphael Lemkin. Um, he was very um, adamant about having this neologism, genocide, um, uh, acknowledge the aim to destroy also the cultural foundations um, of protected groups. Uh, because he believed the focus on uh, physical destruction alone does not um, is not sufficient to understand what genocide really was, at least what he took it to mean. And I have um, a quote from him here, if you um, allow me to, to read it to you. He said, for example, in this aforementioned book, Access, Rule in Occupied Europe, um, is the rather technical title. He says that genocide does not necessarily mean the immediate destruction of a nation but it's intended rather to signify a coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of essential foundations of the life of national groups with the aim of annihilating the groups themselves. Now, you will appreciate just reading this definition that some of the 
uh, practices Volodymyr, men Volodymyr mentioned and, and others you'll hear about um, could be subsumed under this definition, the way Lemkin thought of genocide, because culture, whether it is language and art or, or all kinds of other manifestations of culture, um, of course, are uh, sort of cut to the heart of the identity of collectivities, whether it's the Ukrainian nation um, or other collectivities. And Lemkin understood this, I and mean, he was quite uh, intent on incorporating these dimensions, these cultural dimensions of genocide into the legal document um, that he and others were lobbying for. Now, unfortunately, he was unsuccessful. Um, so his book was published in 1944, as mentioned. In 1948, after a couple of years of negotiations, the United Nations adopted the Convention on Genocide. Now, if you look at that definition, I'd be happy to sort of read um, some of the um, elements of it in a moment. Um, this cult these cultural features that were important to Lemkin um, were not present. Uh, there was active lobbying by a number of different um, um, participants not to feature strongly um, these practices of cultural um, destruction, which is why the law of genocide as it stands currently as the international law of genocide uh, prioritizes, uh, with few exceptions, the physical destruction, the material destruction of groups, and is less concerned um, with the kinds of destruction of museums and such. Um, these in international law, for the most part, can be investigated, prosecuted, adjudicated as war crimes, as crimes against humanity, and other international crimes. Now, you will probably all appreciate that nowadays the term genocide has a certain um, connotation. It has a certain meaning attached to it as a result of the Holocaust. So there is this presumed hierarchy of crimes. And there is this notion out there that genocide is the worst of international crimes, the worst set of atrocities. War crimes, crimes against humanity are somehow lesser. Um, we may disagree on whether this is true, but this is certainly the perception out there. And as a result of this, um, what has also happened is there has been a clamoring for people to think of what is called cultural genocide. Right? So in response to the exclusion of this particular facet of genocide that Lemkin uh, found so important, people in the last sort of 20 years have begun to talk about cultural genocide, uh, and of course also in the specific context of Ukraine. Now, um, before I say more about cultural genocide and, and what this is, let me perhaps say a little bit more about um, the law um, of international of genocide. And, and if you permit me sort of one opening remark, of course, um, we don't have to think of genocide in legal terms. We are entirely free to think of genocide in non-legal terms i.e. if we believe there is a limitation in the law of genocide, um, we, not, uh, we don't have to use that particular understanding. In fact, um, many scholars and, and advocates out there believe that we can also think of genocide differently. However, having said that, because the legal definition is so prevalent and is also bandied about um, in, in the news a great deal, and yesterday, if you were New Yorker readers, uh, Omer Bartov, who was an Israeli historian who teaches at Brown, a, a renowned scholar of the Holocaust, was asked to explain the relationship between genocide and extermination as a crime against humanity, and there's a couple of things that didn't entirely add up. So the law of genocide is actually in important to understand, so I'm going to sketch in a few features that perhaps you might, you might find useful if you permit me. Now, like with any crime um, in a legal system such as the American one, we tend to distinguish between two elements. We tend to distinguish uh, between a mental element and a physical element. Another way to put this is, in order for a prosecutor to achieve a conviction of an indicted individual, he or she or they would have to demonstrate that this individual committed bad acts, and he or she or they did so with the requisite guilty mind. These two facets sort of cut through all kinds of uh, criminal laws. Now, when it comes to genocide, uh, and you probably have heard this, there's a certain complication. Now, the, the physical elements of the law of genocide, uh, the international law of genocide, are the following. We would have to find an individual 
Um, and this is a definition that is incorporated in the Rome Statute Interna of the International Criminal Court. I say a few more things about this court in a moment in case you are, you're not familiar and, and it's easy to get confused because there's a bunch of courts out there. There's also a bunch of international courts in The Hague, in the Netherlands, so I'm going to fill in some blanks there perhaps in a moment. But let me read to you what the current um, um, the, the bad acts that can be committed under the international law of genocide. Let me read them out to you. You can commit genocide by either killing members of a protected group, and I'll say more about the protected groups in a moment. You can do so by causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of a protected group. Another way to fulfill this physical element is to uh, deliberately inflict on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. And here again, you hear the physical bit, right? Here it's even emphasized. The fourth um, way to commit genocide is to impose measures intended to prevent birth within the group. And the last and fifth um, physical way uh, to commit genocide is to forcibly transfer children of the group to another group. And all of these different acts were inspired by Lemkin's um, observations about the Holocaust. But as he also said in 1944, the term is new, but the crime is ancient. So he was very adamant to suggest that this was not just about the Holocaust. He was trying to capture um, a particular crime um, that um, is um, out of time, um, if you will. Now, the international law of genocide, in order to acquire, to gain a conviction, a prosecutor would have to demonstrate that an accused has committed either one or a couple of these acts I just read out to you. And now it gets a little bit more complicated. In addition to then demonstrating that this individual uh, intended to, really meant to kill members of group or forcibly transfer children, the international law of genocide requires a prosecutor to then also demonstrate that the accused did so with the intent to destroy in whole or in part an ethnical, national, racial, or religious group as such. And that is often where in the post-war period international prosecutions have fallen down because it's very, very difficult um, to demonstrate um, this, this two-level a requirement of intent. It's sometimes known as the special intent of genocide. And this is extremely difficult and it's even more difficult if the accused, let's say Putin for instance, uh, Vladimir Putin, is very far removed from the actual uh, physical acts of genocide. Um, and this is something we can maybe discuss uh, more later on today in, in the context of very concrete examples of acts in, in Ukraine. And if you permit me one or two more minutes to tell you a little bit about these courts that are out there, because you will read about them a lot, you also read a great deal about them in relation to Israel and, and in Gaza right now. Um, in The Hague, the two courts that are often confused are the International Court of Justice, or ICJ for short, and there's the other court, the International Criminal Court, the ICC. Now, the ICJ was created um, after the war. This is the judicial organ of the United Nations. This particular court does not try individuals. Uh, it is there to settle disputes between or among states. When we talk about international crimes and atrocities, uh, especially the individual responsibility uh, of accused, we are usually talking about the ICC. Now, there have been a few genocide cases also uh, the adjudicated or heard at the ICJ, but they had to do with the responsibility of states. In particular, one that stands out, the responsibility of the state of Serbia uh, for genocidal acts committed uh, on the territory of Bosnia Herzegovina during the disintegration of the former Yugoslavia, and in particular, uh, genocidal violence committed in Srebrenica and in various parts of northern Bosnia. But the International Criminal Court is a more recent court. It was created by way of an international treaty in Rome in 1998 and it became operational in 2002. Um, and the prosecutor who also visited uh, Ukraine uh, today is called Karim Khan. He was previously a defense attorney uh, at a 
variety of international tribunals. So when you hear the name Karim Khan in relation to Ukraine, um, the discussion is about the International Criminal Court. Um, and maybe I can fill in or sort of elaborate later on if there is a need, but I think this perhaps is, is a useful starting point for now. Uh, actually, this was, if I may say, a masterful presentation of sort of the ABCs of how the crime of the history of the crime of genocide and how the and, and how the, the crime of genocide works from a from a legal perspective. And we have a room full of people here who know a genocide is occurring in Ukraine right now. And this is a great um, introduction to what. Um, our next speaker will be talking about um, Professor Dmitro Koval is an associate professor in the International Law Department of the Faculty of Law, National University of Kiev Mohila Academy. He's advised numerous multilateral entities such as the Council of Europe, UNESCO, and the European Parliament, as well as Ukrainian governmental entities on public international law issues. He is co-author with Dean Van Her and others of a recent article um, coming out in an Oxford legal journal contextualizing the war on Ukraine and the crime of genocide. Um, among other issues, the authors consider the destruction of culture and cultural heritage as indicative of the intent to commit genocide. So um, I'm gonna pass this over to uh, Professor Kaval. Thank you, uh, Teresa, and uh, uh, I'm also honored to be here today with you and to uh, share uh, our conclusions from the article that uh, Teresa just mentioned that we published recently, and also to um, explain a bit more what this cultural uh, element of cultural dimension of genocide may look like and how we should approach it uh, through the using the existing international and national law. So, but l let me make a sta step back and start with a disclaimer that I usually use when I speak about international crimes that are being committed uh, in Ukraine. So criminal law in general is uh, a binary set of rules. Uh, by this I mean that international criminal law, criminal law in general, it may give you just two answers regarding the particular legal situation or particular uh, uh, action that might be uh, classified as crime. And those uh, answers would be yes or no. So what uh, uh, legal pre or criminal law might tell you uh, about this situation in Ukraine, for instance, with regards to genocide, it may say that genocide has been committed or it has not been committed. But this doesn't really mean that uh, uh, the uh, atrocities uh, are not happening in Ukraine. Even the negative answer would not mean that uh, atrocities are not being uh, committed or are not happening in Ukraine. It just means that certain legal elements are missing or there is um, com complications uh, to prove that uh, beyond reasonable doubt that certain uh, individuals committed uh, genocide or that in their actions a uh, prosecutor was able to establish all the required mental and physical or actus reus and answer elements of genocide. So I think it's very important to remember this, that we are not speaking about uh, um, whether the war in Ukraine is, is good or bad, whether atrocities are happening or not. We are just talking about the very particular, very specific legal concept, which is genocide, and uh, how it's applicable to the situation in Ukraine. So even negative answers, a uh, negative answer to the question whether uh, we can establish all the uh, legal requisites, requisites of genocide in Ukraine would not uh, really um, excuse to, uh, in a, to an extent uh, Russian Federation from the uh, first of all, a crime of aggression that uh, has been committed, and after that, uh, all other atrocity crimes that followed. So with this in mind, uh, I want to return once again to uh, original Lemkin's uh, concept. Uh, ten years before uh, Lemkin co uh, coined uh, the term genocide, he um, spoke on the Congress uh, of, uh, of Criminal Lawyers in Europe, and uh, on that con Congress he uh, made the point that um, there are two crimes that should be somehow prosecuted and punished, and that are uh, committed against not just individuals, but also against groups. And those crimes he, he named barbarism, which is physical destruction, and vandalism, which is the destruction of cultural identity. 
So these uh, uh, initial thoughts of Lemkin, initial ideas of his, uh, influence later his uh, perception and his uh, fr framing of uh, the concept of genocide. Because Lemkin indeed thought that uh, genocide is kind of an umbrella term for both vandalism and, um, and uh, barbarism. And uh, this vandalism part of, uh, of genocide is uh, actually cultural destruction, destruction of cultural identity of the group. Uh, as we were explained in 1948, indeed states uh, didn't really agree with Lemkin on, on that cultural side of the, of the genocide uh, definition, genocide notion. Uh, there were many reasons for that. Some uh, were afraid that there will be manipulations with the term of genocide. Others thought that uh, some um, episodes from, the, uh, from the, those states' history may be classified as genocide and uh, so used against uh, those countries. So a number of reasons influenced why uh, states decided to go forward with rather limited uh, idea of genocide. But that's what happened. Anyhow, uh, despite this, uh, when the first uh, genocide charges were brought uh, uh, with regards to uh, crimes committed in Yugoslavia, um, the uh, International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia found the way to somehow accommodate um, initial Lemkin's idea and to speak about the cultural side of genocide, um, uh, genocidal atrocities. Um, that was done in the case, uh, Krstic uh, case, uh, which is maybe not that important for you, the name of the case, but uh, the, the conclusion is important. And the conclusion was that uh, very often when we can see the genocide uh, is being committed, we simultaneously see the destruction of cultural heritage of the particular group that is under attack. Uh, in Yugoslavia, it was quite clear uh, this connection between the destruction of cultural heritage and the destruction of group, because the cultural heritage that uh, ha uh, was uh, being uh, dis uh, destroyed, it was very emblematic for the group of uh, Bosnian uh, Muslims. Uh, and uh, when I say emblematic, uh, I mean uh, that mostly um, religious cultural heritage uh, was uh, um, targeted by the uh, Serbs uh, uh, during the uh, hostilities, during the uh, armed conflict there. So uh, for uh, ICTY, for the criminal tribunal in, uh, for the former Yugoslavia, it was uh, comparatively easy to establish this link between uh, attacks, encroachments on cultural life and cultural heritage, and uh, the um, uh, genocide or physical destruction of the group of Bosnian uh, Serbs. Um, but anyhow, the, the conclusion stands. So the uh, encroachments on cultural heritage may indicate that uh, the crime of genocide is being committed, that there is this mental element of the crime of genocide. So the intention to destroy uh, physically uh, the protected group. Uh, this conclusion was later confirmed by the International uh, Court uh, uh, for Justice, so that the court that deals with the interstate disputes, not uh, uh, with criminal issues. Um, and uh, in two cases brought against Serbia, uh, the same conclusions uh, was made by, by that court. The conclusion that indeed uh, um, attacks against culture may uh, uh, may um, uh, prove that uh, the mental element is there. So it was the case of Bosnia uh, and Herzegovina uh, versus uh, Serbia and Montenegro, and uh, also a Croatian case against Serbia. So those two, in those two cases, ICJ uh, supported the found, uh, findings uh, of the Tribunal for Yugoslavia. Later, uh, and that was uh, International Criminal Court, um, the case of Darfur uh, came about. And in Darfur case, the International Criminal Court also uh, tried to find out whether the uh, attacks on African tribes in Darfur may be classified as genocide. And uh, uh, one of the conclusions that uh, were uh, highlighted uh, by the uh, International Criminal Court um, was that indeed very often the attacks uh, and th that intend to physically destroy the protected group coincide with the encroachments on cultural life and uh, cultural uh, traditions and cultural heritage of the protected group. So uh, ICC uh, lately also joined the 
other international courts uh, in con conf uh, by confirming that indeed there is a link between what uh, uh, Lemkin would uh, name uh, vandalism and genocide as we know it from the um, Genocide Convention and the Rome Statute. So when we speak about the attacks against cultural heritage, we should understand that the attacks themselves do not uh, form the crime of genocide, but they allow us to prove that uh, uh, the mental element of the crime of genocide uh, may be found uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the particular situation. Um, what we see in Ukraine, and I think other speakers will uh, talk about uh, this a bit more, we see uh, indeed huge um, uh, uh, level of destruction of cultural uh, heritage. Um, according to Ministry of Culture uh, of Ukraine, uh, we speak about hundreds of um, different objects uh, in Ukraine um, destroyed by now uh, or damaged. Um, UNESCO confirms uh, at least, uh, I would say, one third of those uh, uh, objects that were uh, reported by Ministry of Culture. Uh, that's due to different methodology that UNESCO uh, uses, not because uh, UNESCO disbelieves in some of the data that Ukraine provides. Um, but uh, we see this large number of objects damaged or destroyed, uh, objects that represent some portion of Ukrainian cultural identity. What else we see? is the encroachment on what is called intangible cultural heritage. And here I have to make a pause and again, make a step back because uh, in the past, it was not clearly formulated in the decisions of international courts that encroachments or attacks on intangible cultural heritage, like traditions, like literature, like language, uh, matters to establish the existence of uh, genocidal intent. But in uh, doctrine, in literature, scholars who uh, uh, worked on uh, the um, uh, g g uh, worked uh, with the topic of genocide, who wrote uh, um, about it, uh, they all agree that, or almost all agree that, uh, indeed, uh, the um, attacks against intangible cultural heritage also. Um, also shows, also demonstrates uh, that uh, um, the uh, genocidal intent is present. So, um, what we should look in, in Ukraine, uh, in Ukrainian situation, is not only the tangible manifestation of tangible uh, culture, but also the intangible one, which is indeed language, which is literature, which is uh, the way Ukrainians tell their history and um, the uh, um, traditions, including religious traditions. So in the areas that were occupied since 2022, and even before, frankly, since 2014, we saw those encroachments, those attacks against in uh, intangible uh, cultural heritage. Uh, in fact, uh, we saw that uh, the libra uh, libraries uh, that uh, contained, uh, that uh, um, had some um, Ukrainian, searching Ukrainian books uh, in their funds, they were uh, um, attacked and they were robbed, they were uh, pillaged, and later the books uh, were even uh, put on fire. We also saw that uh, programs in Ukrainian schools, educational programs in Ukrainian schools were changed in order to basically um, eliminate Ukrainian language from the educational process. And also uh, in order to replace uh, Ukrainian way of telling history of uh, its own by the Russian uh, approach and uh, Russian reading of Ukrainian history, which is basically not about Ukrainians at all, but rather about uh, Russians and uh, their uh, smaller bro brothers. So, um, on the occupied territories, we saw those, um, those uh, uh, attacks against intangible cultural heritage. This taken together with the attacks on um, tangible cultural heritage may, uh, uh, may um, uh, or allows us to uh, preliminary conclude that there are at least grounds to believe that crime of genocide uh, is being committed in Ukraine. I think that this is a great note to end the, the legal discussion on, um, and maybe we'll, you know, and then we'll uh, transition to a description of the actual instances of destruction. And um, I could speak with you a long time about this, as I know many, many uh, audience members as well. So um, we're going to move to our next speaker, who is um, 
Katerina um, Goncharova, and she is the uh, Ukraine Heritage Specialist for the World Monuments Fund, which is one of the leading heritage preservation NGOs globally. Um, she'll, she's remote. Hi, Katerina. Um, she will talk to us about the work of the World Monument Fund in Ukraine, citing specific examples of destruction of culture, tying into Dmitra's pr pr uh, presentation, and the work undertaken to preserve Ukraine's cultural heritage. Katerina, welcome. Um, hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me as a speaker. And if I am allowed, I would share my screen and the presentation that I prepared. Um, just a second. So when we talk about uh, cultural heritage and the loss of cultural heritage of Ukraine, we first need to figure out what exactly have been damaged. What is the loss of our cultural heritage? So one of our strategic projects that WMF is supporting is damage assessment project for architectural sites. And as we may know, there are, uh, the last number that the Ministry of Culture provided to us is that 853 heritage sites had been damaged or destroyed completely during ongoing war. And UNESCO verifies only 327. The point is that there were a lot, numeral, numerous attempts to assess the exact number of historic sites that have been damaged. But uh, mainly those initiatives by UNESCO's CRI, they were uh, based firmly on remote monitoring missions, like um, analyzing uh, satellite images or something like that. But we supported our partners on the ground heritage, uh, uh, HEMA heritage monitoring lab, uh, to send expeditions on the ground and to conduct their damage assessment on site. What made those exhibitions so fantastic is that, um, we're conduct, uh, we, we have our eyes and our professional vision on the site. So multidisciplinary groups team up with municipal governments to assess professionally what had exactly been damaged. So we have a full picture of what exactly was actually going on right there on the field. So of course, we are doing supporting this project from a perspective of further reconstruction, not accountability, because this it turns out it's completely two, two almost completely different directions in which you can go in your damage assessment efforts. So it, when we talk about damage assessment for reconstruction, I will only point out some very, very practical issues because of course the database that had been created through those mission, uh, through those missions is a wealth of information. But from my perspective as a representative of WMF as, as a historic preservationist, it allows us to have to have a big picture, meaning that we see what's going on, uh, we can strategize, uh, we can define where the needs are, because sometimes needs are, it's, it's really great when someone can articulate the exact need that they have. And uh, it's our role to assist the local partner to get resources that they need to restore or stabilize the building. It allows to reduce the scope of work and the budget for the project. For example, when we talk about a stabilization project, when we have the information from our partners on the ground with initial drawings, measurements, and especially when we have a 3D scan uh, um, model of the building, it basically allows us to reduce the budget up to 20%. This is very significant for anyone who's interested in uh, support of stabilization and reconstruction efforts. And of course, it's consolidate local stakeholders because Ukrainian community is very polarized and it's really hard to find uh, a certain agreement that everyone would uh, support. So anything, any strategy that engages and suggests uh, 
uh, public engagement or community engagement is really, really hard one. It's really hard to bring people together, but it's almost impossible in a situation of ongoing war. But this project allows us to assess not only the buildings, but also communities. It's the most important lesson learned because uh, we're learning every step we make uh, this project laid a foundation for absolutely new discovering in, in this ecosystem of uh, heritage protection in the situation of ongoing war. We are trying to do everything. This is the most advanced experience that pretty much could be uh, used full for all kind of international companies and institutions that are uh, prioritizing safeguarding irreplaceable heritage in the situation of crisis. So we're learning a lot through this process as well, even though there are some uh, guidelines and some rules how to conduct the damage assessment and what to do afterwards. But still, uh, all of uh, this project and damage assessment that we support is, is truly meaningful. And I wish we could do that as fast as possible, not on the on the, this initial stage, but it's a very good that we're advancing it even now. So where this project leads us, I think pretty much almost all of you uh, have seen the, this, the picture of this Library of Youth or Museum of Ukrainian Antiquities in Chernigiv. First, we received the information about this building from our partners in the HEMO, uh, Heritage Emergency Rescue Initiative at that time. And this building that was de almost destroyed by air bombs uh, immediately attracted our attention. It was televised all over. It became um, a star, a, a solemn and black star of all media that only covered any news about cultural heritage and Ukrainian war. So we approached the local community and we approached uh, municipal government requesting kind of initiating discussion on this building. And first we undertook the winterization project because the building could not withstand the winter. So that was a very rapid measures how to protect it from the weather drops, precipitations and things like this. And then we came up with a bigger project on uh, urgent stabilization of constructions of this building. We worked with architects and preservationists and came up with a solution that the, the damage that the building overlooked had has to be had to be marked on that on its facade. So we are healing the building, but the scar will remain on its facade forever. So it became part of its history. And of course, there there were a number of architectural solutions how to basically uh, convey this idea, and we end up with this the first one, the biggest the biggest picture that was supported by a number of, of scientific meetings and consultations with local community and the experts and the, and the government. So now the project is in progress. We're hoping to finish. Katerina, can you hear us? And so this is again another project for fast stabilization, the Koralanko Library in Kharkiv that almost lost its roof because of the explosion wave. Again, we received the information and were introduced to the director of this library by our friends on the ground uh, by uh, the team lead of the pro project on damage assessment. And this is again one of our project, Okhtirka Library Muse uh, Local History Museum. Again, we're on the second stage now because previously winterized, put a new roof to protect the, the, the ruined building. And now we're rehabilitating the basement, but following all rules and requirements for civil safety spaces. So the basement will serve as a safe place that continue where the, the cultural and social life can continue despite of permanent air alerts and things like this. So uh, our investment in this, all of those projects is very um, serious and essential. 
uh, but mainly our uh, commitment to support the local administrations, local governments and local communities. And of course, current situation provides an opportunity to change the whole system of management and preservation of cultural heritage. Because again, we're acting in a situation of ongoing war where safety, safety come first. But again, we're, we're hope for fast post-war recovery stage where we can finally uh, come through from uh, tactical steps to a strategic vision of a prod problem. And of course, with the ass assistance from the international and EU organization, Ukraine will be able to write a new chapter in its history covered in stone of reconstructed buildings. So thank you for your attention. Unfortunately, I will not be able to stay till the very end of the event because it's really late my time in Ukraine. But I wish you all a fruitful discussion. And thank you, again once again. Um, Katerina and Roxelana and Ihor, I, I actually thank you very much for joining from Kyiv where it's late, it's dark, and maybe even dangerous and, and with a, a fragile internet. So, you know, very much appreciated and, um, you know, this message of, of hope and rebuilding and, you know, creating new ways of thinking about things and new ways of thinking about law is, is really, um, I think, an important takeaway from all of us, for all of us. Um, our next speaker is, is Roxana Makar who is affiliated with the Ukrainian Heritage Monitoring Lab, where she documents damage to Ukrainian cultural, cultural heritage. She uses, adapts, and develops forensic heritage methodology and also works on the Wall Evidence Project, um, which is an open source archive of Russian military graffiti in Ukraine. Uh, Roxolana will talk to us about her work on damage assessment and accountability. Welcome, Roxolana. Thank you, Teresa. Do you hear me well? Very well. Yes. Yes. Uh, excellent. I'll share my screen right now. Uh, do you see everything? Yes. Hey, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Katrina already mentioned uh, our organization, HEMA, Ukrainian Heritage Monitoring Lab. And uh, today I'll just uh, quickly uh, go through my field experience because uh, for a year uh, now I've been uh, documenting damage on site. Uh, uh, so uh, I'll just show you like the big picture and quickly go through some examples of uh, cultural heritage damage in Ukraine. So. Uh, as uh, Katarina mentioned, uh, there are like uh, some es estimated numbers of this, uh, damage uh, to cultural heritage in Ukraine, but it's only estimate because uh, we have uh, a significant lack of data uh, on the occupied territories and also uh, the uh, uh, liberated territories in Ukraine are not all safe to document. So uh, this map you are seeing right now uh, is uh, the number of documented sites uh, our organization have done. So as you see, uh, the biggest number is in Kharkiv, where we have a local team uh, and uh, they uh, are able to document uh, all the damage really quickly because they are living in a city. Uh, also, we have Kherson that uh, we uh, verified and quickly documented uh, with uh, help of Ukrainian military. And uh, all the other uh, regions you, you see uh, was documented with uh, uh, my participation. So uh, these are regions I can speak for uh, more. Uh, so. Um, yeah, and as you see, uh, already these uh, numbers are bigger than UNESCO's, for example. So, uh, and uh, we did not cover all the damage uh, in uh, liberated and even not occupied territory, because you do see Lviv region, which is like far west of Ukraine and considered uh, like safer, uh, but uh, it also is not immune to the damage of cultural heritage by rocket attacks. By the way, we are having rocket attack on Kyiv right now, so, as I speak. So uh, that's why our image is like um, 
not very pretty because uh, we are uh, in corridors and safe places. Uh, so anyway, um, our methodology uh, is uh, varied, like uh, uh, Katerina uh, said about uh, ICRAM, like uh, um, questionnaires and uh, uh, laser scans and photogrammetry. These are for uh, documentation for the cases Katerina had shown. Uh, and uh, I work with forensic heritage documentation, uh, which was developed by our American colleagues, uh, uh, namely Smithsonian Institution and uh, uh, Culture Emergency Response. Uh, so they uh, were developing it in uh, on the case of Iraq uh, Mosul Museum. Uh, and uh, right now we are uh, trying to use it uh, on Ukrainian case, which have some specifics. Um, and these specifics are, uh, first of all, timing, because uh, we are able to access the sites uh, in really different uh, time after the damage was done. Like when we were uh, beginning our documentation process in uh, September 22, uh, it uh, could be like uh, six months after the destruction, up to a year. And uh, right now we are able to achieve two days. Uh, this was our like record uh, with the Art Museum. Uh, so, and uh, of course, uh, this uh, hugely affects the documenting process because uh, uh, the uh, uh, state of the site uh, is uh, hugely wide. Uh, then we have a quantity of the size because uh, right now we have surveyed uh, like more than 500 sites uh, and uh, that uh, number is increasing. And uh, uh, when we are speaking uh, of documentation, uh, documenting of uh, cultural heritage sites, Roxana, do you hear us? We we can't hear you. We're going to give it a minute or so. The specific uh, uh, aspect of our documenting process is diversity because the sites are really different and they are uh, damaged with different uh, weapons and different uh, situations. Uh, for example, the city or town could be occupied or not occupied, and uh, it could be shelled by with artillery, rocket attacks, and of course, uh, the uh, damage is really different. So, a few examples of what I'm talking about. Uh, that's, uh, 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 that building was uh, a forest uh, research station in Trostenets, uh, Soma region, and uh, Trostenets was a Uh, the Russian military war, were withdrawing from the city and uh, uh, it was fired uh, by the Russians who, from a tank and uh, it was uh, destroyed with fire. So like the facade is uh, all that uh, uh, was left and uh, the, local, uh, the locals were not able to stop this fire because it was not safe to go out from the basements. Um, that's in Mikolaev region, also a site I documented, uh, it's uh, the Catholic Church, actually, and uh, it was uh, shelled with different weapons uh, up to four times, and uh, you can see like different kinds of destruction, because on your left uh, there's like the big destruction from aerial attack, and then you have this large hole in the uh, wall that remained, and uh, Roxana, uh, your internet connection is very fragile. So, um, if you hear us, let's 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 go, go forward and keep our fingers crossed. Okay. Uh, do you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, uh, like I said, like uh, this building uh, suffered several attacks from the Russian military during and after the occupation uh, of uh, this uh, village of Kiselivka and Mikolaev region. Uh, Chernihiv Drama Theater is also like a very famous case uh, because uh, 
lots of people suffered during that attack uh, in uh, the, this August. And uh, like seven people died and uh, up to 150 people were uh, wounded by this attack. And while the uh, building itself suffered like mild damage, uh, but uh, the missile uh, was uh, exploded uh, um, not inside the theater, but uh, uh, on the roof. And uh, that caused uh, significant damage to people on the square. Uh, because there is a huge square like uh, uh, near that building, and you can see it on the photo uh, through the windows. Uh, and uh, the last like very famous case is the Dessa Fine Art Museum that was damaged like just now, and uh, I've just returned from this expedition. And uh, this is also like a very significant case of uh, like uh, where there's nothing to target uh, in from military point of view on this side because uh, no military targets uh, are uh, on the vicinity of this building. All only uh, residential buildings and the museum itself. Uh, Roxorana, we lost you again. But uh, the building will uh, need uh, like serious reconstruction works. And uh, uh, for the last uh, um, slide, I wanted to point out that uh, there are also looted museums in Ukraine, at least 11 uh, we, uh, that we know about uh, on the occupied territories. Like in Mariupol, uh, for example, there are lots of looted museums. And uh, uh, here I personally can see a pattern where like uh, the uh, Russian culture uh, parts of collection are being looted. And uh, the parts of uh, the collection that can be considered as Ukrainian art are being destroyed. For example, in Mariupol Museum, that was the case because uh, lots of paintings of like uh, traditionally Russian uh, uh, artists like Ivazovsky, Kuinji uh, were looted uh, by like uh, organized looting. And uh, then uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, paintings by, for example, uh, Tatiana Yablonska and other like Ukrainian artists were just destroyed in the fire and the tax. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, finishing my presentation, I wanted to urge you like to visit our website because we have uh, more reports there and also you can uh, make requests for data, for example, for Chrome uh, forms we made and uh, other uh, things we created and we are like really ready for corporations on that uh, uh, field. So thank you. <laughs> I, I hope you heard something I, I said. We, we did, Katarina. It was um, an excellent presentation. And it's really hard for me to think that this sort of selective destruction of physical property is, has any military objective. It, it really is. Um, ev it's evidence of an intention to, to destroy, to destroy culture, to destroy intangibles, to destroy a people. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ihor Pushevailo, who some of you may have seen on 60 Minutes last Sunday. Um, Ihor is the general director of the Museum of the Maidan and a cultural activist, ethnologist, museologist, cultural manager, and art curator. Um, he's held positions in the Ukrainian government and was a Fulbright scholar at the Smithsonian. Um, he will discuss the destruction of culture and specifically the extent and the systematic nature of the discretion, d destruction. Uh, welcome, Ihor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And yeah. Right now in Kyiv, it's not only late and dark, but it's quite noisy because Russians again attacked by drones and missiles. Uh, let me share uh, my screen. Uh, do you see it? Yes. <clears throat> oh, 
on how to make cultural heritage and cultural sphere infrastructure much more resilient. Uh, and what we are engaged mostly in uh, to do this. Uh, I will I will quickly come because my uh, Katerina and Roxolana brilliantly described the, the, the scape of destruction and uh, uh, for us it's really very painful because on February 22 explosions woke, up, woke me up in Kyiv and Russian airstrikes, missiles, shelling and tank fires touched it not only uh, our families but our cultural heritage and uh, uh, thus began the full-scale war and it became a turning point not only for Ukraine but for the whole of the world. Uh, speaking about the second culture and in the context of today's discussion, it's, it is quite clear that Putin's regime ignored the basic international military and humanitarian laws, including the Hague Convention of 1954 and its protocols on the protection of cultural property in the event of armed conflict, and not spontaneously due to so-called military necessity. The desire to reboot the cultural identity of Ukrainians was at the core of the Kremlin's genocidal policy. And uh, we can see the results of the Russian offensive, so-called offensive, which speak for themselves. And Katerina mentioned some figures. And you can see <clears throat> um, dozens of destructed monuments and hundreds of historical buildings, cultural centers, religious sites. Um, according to the Ministry of Culture uh, inventory, uh, traumatic pictures of the destroyed heritage sites, historical buildings, museums, memorials, churches, mosques, and even synagogues, uh, cultural and art centers became uh, world known. Here, one more example is uh, one of the first and also well-known fact of the war crime, Mariupol Theater, uh, drama theater where hundreds of residents tried to escape Russian air bombing, but in vain. Or another one in one of the uh, wooden churches which we documented uh, in Zhitomir region, close to Russian border, 60 kilometers uh, wooden church, uh, dated 1862, uh, was damaged uh, by Russian shelling. And right now, after winter, it is collapsed much more. That's the winterization process is so very important. And Okhtirka already mentioned. Sorry? Um, and of course, uh, the official statistics by Ministry of Culture and Informational Policy of Ukraine uh, is shocking but incomplete, as Ukraine has no access to temporary occupied territories and cannot assess the range of damage there. The four satellite laboratories of the United States and Great Britain help monitor the condition of cultural objects providing information from regions, temporarily not under Ukraine's control and documenting the facts of intentional attacks on the heritage and collecting data for the future uh, proceedings and the international courts. A vivid example of the monitoring of Ukraine's uh, over 30,000 cultural objects by Smithsonian Institution and Cultural Heritage Monitoring Lab in Virginia. Uh, mentioned today uh, war crimes, not only destruction, but uh, looting, theft, uh, illicit trafficking, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, facts mentioned today, uh, in particular by Roxolana, and of course, 11 or even some more, because we, we have no exact data on, on this. Uh, but what is interesting that uh, some, some of the stolen items were taken to temporarily occupied Crimea, and these objects were identified. And these artifacts were stolen from Kherson Art Museum, and they were identified from the photographs, from social media, and they were identified being located at the Tavrida Central Museum in Simferopol. 
Uh, but what is important uh, uh, is that not only uh, damage caused by military actions or intentional looting and illicit trafficking, but also uh, intentional uh, damage of historical objects and uh, iconic uh, cultural, cultural sites is also a kind of a policy of Russian uh, Federation. And uh, here you can see some vivid examples, Maria Primachenko and uh, some other naive art, uh, artists and painting collections were uh, attacked uh, in Ivankiv, a local museum, uh, not to Kiev. You can see what has left from this museum on the photograph up left, up, up, up right, sorry. And another, another iconic example, uh, the museum and historical building uh, close to Kharkiv in the village of Skovorodinivka. Uh, the historical building where Grigory Skovoroda, also iconic uh, person for Ukrainian identity, stayed for some time and the museum uh, named after him was opened, established here in Ukraine, but completely damaged by a Russian army. And so uh, from what, what is important in this uh, narrative that um, from the very first days of the massive uh, missile strikes, the Ukrainian museums, libraries, and archives responded to the threat through their capabilities and the military situation. Uh, some of them managed to, to evacuate cultural values, but for others, it was already too late as uh, their territories were occupied very quickly. And you can see some examples how cultural activists, activists in cooperation with local authorities and communities turn public spaces into so-called cultural barricades, sheltering monuments and sculptures, safe decorations and other artistic and historical objects with OSB panels and sandbags for protection. And this mitigates uh, the chances the, the, the vulnerability of these buildings and committing the crimes. And so uh, the solidarity of the whole world coming together to protect culture in times of war is unprecedented in scale. And so uh, we, in the first days of the war, uh, large scale attack on Ukraine on February last year, we uh, self-organized and we uh, co-founded uh, together with NGO Tustang uh, Harry, Harry, Heritage Emergency Response Initiative, and uh, its functions and its main goals um, you know, were uh, dependent upon upon the needs and the needs the dynamics of needs were very uh, active. First, of, first of all, we needed uh, some materials and packaging materials and protection equipment to protect collections, and later um, we had to provide financial support on the ground. And you can see the partnership in action. And just not all, it's not possible to name all uh, our international partners, but at least the most important. And uh, the Harry uh, focused his activities, at least in, in these seven main areas, uh, helping our colleagues because cultural heritage is not only buildings and not only collections, it is only people. Uh, cultural um, cultural professionals, various of the tangible uh, knowledge and traditions and cultural heritage. And uh, this field is also impacted badly. And not many, many efforts uh, presently in Ukraine uh, to document uh, the damage to intangible cultural heritage. Uh, so we also launched uh, the damage assessment, documentation, and recovery planning. Together with the Chrome, we developed uh, the damage and risk assessment form, approbated it in the field, and launched now in several directions, movable, immovable, um, archaeological, and intangible cultural heritage. Um, uh, for this time, uh, for today, we were able uh, to provide uh, organizational assistance and cons consultation to over 500 museums and cultural institutions from 22 regions uh, of Ukraine, provided educational and training activities, 
And uh, you can see also from the slide that we engaged also during our field expeditions, which we tried to make multifunctional, uh, multidisciplinary, to also to document um, the damage by 3D modeling, by laser scanning, engaging international partners, including some volunteers who came from abroad, especially in the very first months, because right now Ukraine developed its capacities and we have national teams who provide these services so perfectly, so professionally. But in the very beginning, for example, Emmanuel Durand, French uh, architect uh, who worked in Beirut, came to Ukraine as a volunteer and participated in a few of our expeditions to Chernihiv, uh, to, to Zhitomer, to document and to teach uh, Ukrainian professionals how to uh, document, document the damage due to, to, to up-to-date technologies. Uh, one of our core activities is training and uh, providing uh, guidelines and developing methodologies. So together with UNESCO, ICROM, ICOMOS, uh, we developed a number of um, guidelines, instructions, toolkits, handbooks, and we provided several trainings. Uh, what is also important and what we engaged in together with ICOM, it's uh, control of illegal trafficking. We talked a lot about it on different levels, on national, international, and in Ukraine, this is the direction which needs uh, bigger support because we talked to Europol, Interpol, we need an inventory of the um, artifacts uh, looted. Uh, and uh, But unfortunately, at the moment, we have only red lists uh, provided by ICOM. And of course, it's not enough. It's important, but not enough at, at the moment. Also, you can see some, some just listed our partners to provide necessary materials and equipment uh, to protect the collections and uh, some also some photographs from our field trips to different regions of Ukraine. Uh, we also uh, try not only to document, but also to musificate and to, um, to do some efforts to prepare memorialization of some objects like in Yahidne, uh, close to Chernihiv, there was a very specific space where Russians uh, captured local residents. And also in, the, in this, in the middle, in the bottom, you can see one of our first artifacts in our collection, uh, the ceramic rooster from town of Borodyanka, close to Kiev, which was air bombed by Russians. And uh, this, this survived uh, a kitchen cabinet with ceramic rooster. Uh, was intact and it became a symbol of Ukrainian uh, resilience and we had to, to preserve it. And uh, also I mentioned today uh, this uh, youth library in Chernihiv and here you can see the first international mission, ICROM, ICOMOS, uh, which documented this site uh, in June last year. Of course, we have a lot of challenges, and uh, these challenges mostly uh, depend uh, upon 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 uh, what mentioned today that the war is ongoing. The, the dynamics of front line is quite big. We don't know when the war will end. Uh, we don't have safe locations in Ukraine. All Ukraine is under attack. No safe places uh, for collections for people. Uh, not easy even to stabilize or, or make early recovery from the buildings because in some regions uh, there is a danger, there is a threat of an, another attack. And of course, we need the support in developing the crisis management leadership in Ukraine. And um, also, uh, we need um, partnership with military uh, to protect cultural heritage and recently. Uh, the military unit, uh, a prototype of CPP unit, was established in Ukraine as a Ihor, um, do you hear us? Enable us. Uh, to document uh, the war crimes 
in zones which are closed to civilian experts. And uh, uh, finalizing, we know we have a lot of challenges, and, but we know what actions needed. And um, we are so grateful to international support, to all our international and national partners. And uh, we look forward to first the coordination and uh, we are sure that together we will be able to respond to all that uh, emergencies and all this situation. And we hope that Ukraine uh, will become a case for other contexts in the world, how to protect cultural heritage in emergencies. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, Ihor. And I would just, before we move to the q and I, I really want to um, thank again our panelists from Ukraine, where it's late, where it's late, where it's dark, and where there are missiles flying. Um, people say Ukrainians are an inspiration to them, and and you are an inspiration to this Ukrainian. Um, so we do have time for a few questions. Um, is is there a mic, Jasper? Yeah. So maybe to um, in back. I'm uh, Marta Zahaykevich. I was here at the museum a month or two ago, and we heard um, Janine Di Giovanni talk with Peter Pomerantsev about the Reckoning Project, and they are actually submitting charges and prosecuted some of the crimes that are going on. And just from what you spoke about and, and what they spoke about, there is this is such an immense, immense effort with so many people involved. It's like everyone appears to have their own sort of point of view or their own definition of their project, in addition to other countries doing their own investigations. And I'm sort of wondering, what is what do you envision what the impact could be of crosstalk between all these other groups? Because it seems like um, what you were talking about earlier is the definitions and, and uh, establishing the elemental forms of what constitutes genocide. You're trying to have a legal concept uh, that's better than, than was before. And you're not prosecuting necessarily. And then there's other people who are prosecuting according to established laws. And I imagine the crosstalk must make a difference eventually for all you guys. Um, who who um, is, I guess, uh, who, who would you like to uh, have respond to this? Oh, if whoever wants. <laughs> um, I, I will nominate Jens for this one. <laughs> All right, thank you um, very much for that question. And you're absolutely right, there is a lot of crosstalk. It's actually a very nice, nice sort of noun you found. Um, whether this necessarily stands in the way of um, moving towards accountability is another question. I think in a way you might also say the crosstalk could be productive because in terms of bringing accountability to Ukraine, you have the uh, prosecutor general's office in, uh, in Kiev, of course, and my colleagues here can, can speak far more eloquently about this, of course. Um, and I think ultimately perhaps the way forward is probably to, to um, let these various efforts of achieving accountability run, run uh, concurrently. Because um, to talk about the, the court that I perhaps know best, the International Criminal Court, which is on many people's minds. Now, the problem there is, and, and you will have perhaps heard about this, um, this court is, uh, has a relatively limited budget uh, has uh, 17 other so-called situations going on. Uh, so Ukraine is one of these situations. Darfur was mentioned before, even though it's dormant, it's still alive. Um, and there's many, many others. So even though Karim Khan, of course, was in, in Kiev and, and may very well bring in the future charges, I mean, he has brought some charges already against Putin and um, um, right, the children and the commissioner. Um, but it remains to be seen whether his office would bring many more charges, uh, like in view of the fact that the budget is limited. Um, and then the question is also if a prosecutor like him would bring charges, 
um, what to focus on. Um, and here, then, a couple of competing imperatives come to mind, and, and you will most likely pick the kinds of um, underlying conduct or criminal conduct that is most likely to lead uh, in a conviction. Um, so I think given all of that, it's probably good that you also, for example, have uh, German prosecutors trying to bring cases in German courts uh, under principle of universal jurisdiction, and you have Ukrainian efforts, and perhaps there might be an international ad hoc tribunal for the crime of aggression that only deals with Russia and, and not with other cases. So in a sense that, yes, there's crosstalk, but I also ex actually see a fair amount of uh, uh, potential for synergy um, that sort of we can, uh, or the international community uh, collectively and, and individually, the various constituent parts, might be able um, to achieve more accountability than were possible if we put all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak. Um, do uh, Dmitra, Dmitra or Vladimir, do you have anything to add? Um, I will just uh, maybe back uh, uh, what, what, what has been uh, said, because indeed uh, we now face a very different situation that we had uh, before in other conflicts. Uh, so many different actors uh, rushed to, to work with Ukraine and to help Ukraine in its accountability efforts that it might bring some uh, meaningful changes and meaningful results uh, that were unseen in other situations uh, around the world. So. Um, I, I would say that, yes, I also see the potential for this synergy. And uh, the fact that there are many organizations working on similar projects doesn't really, uh, or, or, or in most cases at least, uh, doesn't really impact the quality of work and the um, uh, prospects for accountability. Apart from that, I have to mention that uh, reckoning together with other international uh, initiatives that are working right now in Ukraine, they hold, I would say, by monthly calls and by monthly kind of uh, events uh, where they discuss what each of those initiatives are doing in Ukraine, and that helps to coordinate, that helps to back uh, each other's conclusions and uh, basically at least stay aware of other uh, actions and plans uh, in, uh, for the nearest future. So th th there is rather uh, space for synergy, uh, I would say. Very short comment, uh, a little bit different perspective, but uh, just to clarify, International Criminal Court, uh, it's very special court to punish only for elite crimes, we can say. So uh, I think maybe up to 20 or 30 people from Russian leadership could be prosecuted and uh, they, yeah. So almost all other cases should be prosecuted at national level. And uh, having this synergy, having really huge support from international organizations, um, international community, different governments, our general prosecutor's office is responsible for evidence collection, for a special way of communication with national courts, and doing all other things. So uh, very often we have this little bit childish perspective that some international actors will do our job. It's not true. We should work first of all of our national, at our national level and of course use all possible opportunities in international level. And uh, without that we can say synergy or cooperation or very realistic assessment of the situation, it's impossible to move forward and to have real punishment for all uh, people who committed those crimes. So, um, I see a question in the back. Oh, I was going to take a brief moment uh, for an interruption from your sponsor, the Ukrainian Institute of America. The video of that discussion with Janine and Peter Pomerantsev is going to be on our YouTube channel very soon, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, and I will yeah, let you... Yeah, I see a question in the back. This is on. My name is Victor Rudd. I chair the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Ukrainian American Bar Association. And uh, <clears throat> the question is to either of the three panelists, or all three of them. And the basis is this. The bias and the essential equivalence 
of the Ukrainian and Russian has been deeply rooted for generations in the West, particularly in academia, ironically, and in media and politicians. And if we had in 2014 a Russian invasion of France, Germany, France, uh, Italy, Spain, England, I dare say that the visceral emotional reaction alone would have been very, very different than how the world met the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014, accented in February of last year. So the question becomes, in your work, and focusing specifically on this cultural subset, if you will, of genocide, in your work, have you run into, have you had to deal with this uh, bias where the unarticulated reaction is, well, yeah, it's happening and it's too bad, but you know, uh, Ukrainians are really like Russians anyway, and so what? Now, I'm not suggesting that's anywhere near as acute a reaction you would get, but you know what I mean. Or is the alternative reaction the very opposite? That precisely because of the multiplicity of the cultural destruction is so great that you run into in your work with non-Ukrainians, with what I will say the outside world with the West, is that an awakening moment for the people and the institutions that you deal with who would say, yeah, I guess there really is a dichotomy here, which you have to have, of course, in order to have genocide, right? If you don't have two different groups, you really don't have genocide, right? So that is sort of my two-part questions with a flip to it. Thank you. Um, who'd like to take that? Oh, yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much for such a brilliant question. Uh, we started with an idea that uh, parliamentary act on genocide and uh, article which we mm, published in well-recognized uh, international journal, we tried to, to draw a picture from a little bit wider perspective. Because, of course, all that cultural peculiarity is damaged to the, uh, we can say, cultural points, um, even intangible, uh, is very important. But very often abroad, we are facing a position from foreigners that it could be just random damage for all the churches, museums, schools, etc., etc. So the main aim of uh, our work in Kiev Mohila to present for international audience that genocide committed by Russia in Ukraine right now, it's not because of damage for a culture right now. It's because of centuries before. And uh, the real aim of military aggression, it's not just purely to occupy the territory. The real damage, as uh, Putin said on his speech on uh, 21st of February, that uh, Ukraine is integral part of Russia and Russia's historical, cultural, and spiritual space. So from that perspective, of course, they do not recognize our right for self-determination uh, and uh, existence of Ukraine at all. So. Uh, this wider perspective brings us to the po position, to the point that uh, all that small pieces together can uh, present us a more complicated and more complex uh, picture from a legal point of view. And it's not really easy to prove uh, without referring to Holodomor, without referring to Emsky Ukaz, and many other historical documents which could prove all the damage committed by uh, Soviet authorities, Russian Empire authorities, and many other people 
to these relations. And a uh, few months ago, uh, there was a very interesting uh, historical discussion in Oxford, and one of the participants uh, presented an idea that right now it's not a first war between Russia and Ukraine. Russian ideas and Ukrainian ideas is 25th war. Uh, I'm not a specialist in, in, uh, from historical point of view, but I think this is a clear picture for us to understand these roots of military aggression, and I think it could be assessed from legal point two, which is not really easy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have, uh, uh, yes, Professor Blakely. Um, I'd like to address the first part of the question that uh, my colleague from the Ukrainian American Bar Association made, and I'll do it very briefly. I know the definition, um, although I am a lawyer. I am of German heritage. All four of my grandparents came from Germany. I have no Ukrainian background, and prior to the second invasion, which was in 2022, I knew almost nothing about Ukraine. And that is why if Putin had invaded France or Germany, we in the United States would have been up in arms. But in our educational system, when we study world history, we study Greece and Rome and France and Germany and the United Kingdom. We do not study Asia. We do not study Eastern Europe. We do not study Czech Republic, Poland, or Ukraine. And consequently, it is because of our educational system. And I think it's still the same way. It was when I was in high school, in grade school, it was that way. I think it's still the same way. We just don't know about Ukraine, and that's our fault, and we need to increase our education of the people in the United States. I don't think you'll get any words of protest from the crowd here. <laughs> um, and, and, and this is an opportunity. Um, unfortunately, bad things do create opportunities. Um, so at, at this point, I'm going to, we're, we're going to have a reception afterwards, and our panelists have agreed to stay, and there will be plenty of opportunities to ask further questions. But at this point, I'm going to pass uh, the platform along to uh, Dr. Arthur Hrihorovich, who is the vice president of uh, the Ukrainian Institute of America. He passed it back to me. Oh, he passed it back he to you. He passed it back to me. So I'm not sure. I think our batteries are going. May I ask one more quick question, maybe to end on a happy note? It might be easy. So recently I heard that there was actually a recovery of some items of the Crimean gold that was uh, of the, some of the collection from Mariupol or some of, the, some of the artifacts that were stolen. Have you heard about those? I was just curious how they were found and the process for getting them. You have a bunch of ignorant lawyers here oh, in the okay. room. Okay. So maybe All someone, right. maybe maybe. someone on I guess Zoom he, call is still yeah. on who actually knows something. Oh, Roxolana. Yeah, uh, these actually uh, were f back from 2014 when the annexation of Crimea and uh, uh, eastern part of Ukraine uh, uh, started. And uh, um, during that occupation, uh, these golden items uh, were exhibited in Netherlands. And, uh, well, uh, basically, when the exhibition um, ended in Netherlands, uh, the question was where to return these artifacts. Uh, because, like, uh, if they were returned to Crimea, <laughs> they were actually returned to the occupied territory. And uh, so this uh, process was like uh, uh, the duration of this process was like eight or nine years. Uh, and uh, uh, it's like only now where uh, the decision was made and the artifacts returned to Ukraine. Uh, so and these artifacts uh, didn't even were located in Russia. So 
you may uh, just imagine uh, what will the process be with the artifacts that are actually in Russia. Um. Oh, Dmitra. Yeah, I can give a few details. Uh, so indeed, uh, the, the collection was called Sisian Gold. So that's uh, the golden items uh, from Sisian civilization. And uh, the uh, collection arrived from a couple of museums, I think four Ukrainian museums. Some of them were from Crimea and some of them were from mainland Ukraine. It's actually southern Donetsk region indeed. Uh, so they were tr uh, they they uh, they were sent to exhibition in Allard Pearson Museum. Uh, that's a private museum in Amsterdam. Uh, before the invasion to Crimea, so before the occupation happened. Um, after uh, the uh, Russia established control over Crimea, uh, Ukraine demanded these items to be returned to Ukraine. Uh, while a uh, Crimean museum uh, stressed that uh, according to the contract, these items should be returned to Crimean museums. Um, to prevent their return to Ukraine, they uh, went to, uh, uh, to, Netherlands, to the Netherlands courts and uh, requested the Allard Pearson Museum to stick to the, uh, uh, to the provisions of the contract and basically to return those items to Crimea. And quite peculiar that those Crimean museums claim, uh, were claimants uh, uh, under Ukrainian law. So they never said that they were um, uh, legal entities uh, established under Russian law or Crimean law or the, the law of Crimean Republic. Um, so uh, they used Ukrainian law to say that we are Ukrainian museums or museums uh, uh, created by Ukrainian law and we need to get those items back because items should be where the, the, the context is. So where they, they first were recovered, where they can be shown in the context of other uh, items, other cultural artifacts that create the whole collection. So the, the court of first instance in Amsterdam decided in favor of Ukraine. They applied uh, the uh, convention on the return of stolen, uh, stole, stolen cultural objects, and they said that those objects should be returned to Ukraine. Uh, stolen and illegally uh, exported. Uh, so um, that was the first uh, instance. Uh, then uh, these museums, Crimean museums, they uh, uh, tried to reverse the decision. They went uh, to the appellate court of Amsterdam, and that's uh, where the U Ukrainian problems began because uh, some of the uh, one of the judges, uh, he was connected to some energy company of Russia or something like that, and uh, Ukraine um, battled his uh, presence on the panel. Uh, despite this, uh, the appellate court decided in favor of this Crimean, not, not, not actually in favor of Crimean Museum, but they at least over, uh, overrun, uh, overturned uh, the decision of the first instance court. And uh, that's uh, why uh, the hearings took so long. Only now we got the final decision from the appellate court, but there is still a possibility to go higher. A uh, uh, decision that basically says that indeed the items should be returned to Ukraine. So that's a win. It's not final win, and it shows how complicated this international uh, whole international landscape is, and how hard it's sometimes to fight for the for the truth because international law has enough of provision that actually allows you to to fight for truth. But still, uh, the, there are quite a number of complications and different readings of the law that might prevent this from happening. Uh, Dmitra, thank you. That was great. Um, and now I will pass the floor over to Lida. Well, th only to say thank you so much all for being here. We really appreciate it. We have little tokens of appreciation uh, for you. I do want to just welcome the audience to take a visit to the reception across the hall. On the way, please look at the photographs here on exhibit. We just opened this exhibition of photos of Ukrainian refugees in Lithuania. It was a partner project. Andriy Horodisky, who's our advisor at the Institute, is here. He can engage with you over there uh, by renowned uh, Lithuanian photographer. We also have a wonderful tribute to fallen artists downstairs in the room right below us. If you haven't seen that, also it's very powerful. And thirdly, downstairs is our installation of Pesanki, which has a wonderful story. The curator of that is here in the room, Sofika Zelik. So lots to do. Please come have a glass of wine. <laughs> Don't go home yet. Thank you so much for being here.